All right, I'd like to actually take the time to uh, thank our, our next sponsor. So it's Plato Data. Plato Data is an AI-powered content syndication platform for emerging technologies across multiple innovative sectors, including AI, blockchain, fintech, reg tech, and capital markets. Now, capital markets are critical for government, commercial, industrial, and financial institutions. Our next panel of experts will review the legacy markets, the blockchain impact, and its future potential in all of its forms. Please welcome Jim Liu and his team uh, to discuss the future of capital markets. Jim. Paul, why don't you just live up there? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thank you very much. First off, I'd like to thank Gerard and the Government Blockchain Association. This is an amazing honor to be here. Um, we have a really, really interesting discussion. I think that follows nicely from the uh, previous panel. I just want to read a, um, a definition about capital markets from the Federal Reserve. So capital markets are financial markets that bring buyers and sellers together to trade stocks, bonds, currencies, and other financial assets. Capital markets include stock markets and bond markets. Uh, they help people with ideas become entrepreneurs and help small businesses grow into big companies. They also give folks like you and me opportunities to save and invest in our future. <laughs> so this uh, panel discussion is about the future of capital markets, and we have some very, very talented panelists here with us today. And uh, one of the panelists, unfortunately, is not here, and she uh, was going to represent the venture capitalist. But you know, with that, let me introduce myself. My name is Jim Liu. I'm an associate professor at Johns Hopkins Carey Business School. I've been teaching finance for about 10 years, like a decade. Can you believe it? I've been there 10. It's too long. It's way. <laughs> and then I run a, a company called SoCat, named after my two daughters, Sophie and Catherine. So with that, I'm going to send it out. Who wants to go first? Vermont? Please. Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you, Joral and the GB team um, for hosting such an awesome event, which is definitely required. My name is Pramod Attarde. I am uh, co-founder and CEO of Crypto Asset Trading, which we recently renamed as the Apex DeFi Labs. And I'm also a founder of New Jersey Blockchain Council that offers educational and a uh, lot many other services into a New Jersey for Excellent. Paul? Hi, I'm Paul Dowding again, um, uh, co-founder, head of design for Tapestry X uh, in L4S Core. It's a real-time, scalable, high-capacity uh, layer one protocol designed for the capital markets, but has other uh, uses in supply chain and other use cases. Uh, my name is Brian Feinberg. I'm the founder of Zephyr Financial Technologies, as well as Zephyr Technology Ventures. Um, I maintain uh, several securities licensing, including my 763 and 79. I've been uh, somewhat of an autonomous investment banker for the last 13 years and have been participating in the blockchain space since 2014. Excellent. So uh, this panel discussion is about long-term investing. So this is capital markets is about the long-term, not the short-term. It's not about money market funds or central uh, uh, CDs. So my first question to the panel is, why is there such a chasm between traditional and decentralized finance? I'll jump in. How about that? Well, we're, we've been, I think what's evident over the, certainly over the course of the last couple of years is um, the imagination of a lot of people in terms of being able to develop applications that drive a completely new capital market reality. And I just keep going back to watching this transformation 
uh, take place right in front of our eyes and the regulated uh, entities that are out there trying to kind of catch up and get ahead of the curve. So this disparity that we continuously see is really about a redefinition of not only the way that capital markets function, but in terms of the regulatory environments that surround it. Um, and we see a tremendous amount of innovation that is not only coming out delivering this new, um, I would say, paradigm uh, related to, um, you know, trading certainly, but also liquidity and uh, the distribution of, uh, you know, um, direction, I should say, of any kind of um, um, digital asset. Um, I see this marketplace continuously evolving into not only a more regulated environment, which I think we all need, so that we have the ground rules and the frameworks that are in place to be able to create efficiency, but also to be to be uh, embrace uh, compliance wherever it, um, you know, wherever it is. It's very hard sometimes as a developer to be able to kind of look at that landscape and build your product around that. So I think that the regulators need to unify themselves across frameworks that can be universally accepted across the digital asset space. Um, I think if you look at the, the history of the markets and how they actually evolved, um, this has actually created the issue in terms of it used to be sort of open outcry, paper settlements, and if you were in a particular product, equities or bonds or, you know, any derivatives market, you were very specialized and in your own silo. So as technology came around and automated the process, the technology was built for each of the silos. So actually when you settle an equity versus a government bond versus a mortgage-backed security versus a an option or a future, there are actually five different infrastructures. Why? Because that's historically how the industry grew up. So that's the sort of disparate view of the world. The chance with decentralized finance was a whole new technology being implemented for the first time in its sort of entirety. And it's evolved in terms of the, the cleverness. And I think I'll attribute, you know, uh, something to the flexibility of Ethereum to record these transactions. But effectively, Ethereum's become the central clearinghouse for DeFi. But because it was new technology implemented sort of greenfield site, it could do everything consistently, right? And whereas if you look at the traditional finance, it's actually uh, huge, large scale. It's just very slow and clunky. And the main reason they want to replace it is not because they like the new technology, it's because they're running AS400s and still new COBOL programmers. But uh, it's really just large scale. Whereas if you look at the DeFi, it's very innovative and it's quick to a certain extent in terms of settlement, but it's not large scale and it's not high capacity and it's not functionally rich enough to take on TradFi. And that's the chasm in two, two dimensions. Yeah. Uh, the way I look at it, I totally agree with both of you. Uh, the way I look at this market is and traditional is more from a private market. Uh, currently, what we look at, you know, is a public market. Let's say, take an example of, uh, let's say, New York Stock Exchange and how much it values, let's say, yesterday. Maybe $28 trillion, $30 trillion. Uh, how much is dominated by 50 companies? The so 50% of the market is dominated by the maybe 10 companies or 50 companies out of 2,600 listed on that stock exchange. So this decentralized finance, what we look at is opening a door for small and medium businesses more in the private market to, you know, to raise the capital, to bring the money, and uh, opening a lot many opportunities, not only for the public market. So I, I think those are uh, amazing answers. I, I couldn't agree more. I, uh, one of the things I want to um, add, it's kind of interesting if you look at traditional finance and you want to take a company public, oh, sorry. If you want to take a company public, then where do you go? You have to go to the NYSE or maybe NASDAQ, right? And if you wanted to raise a big debt round and issue bonds, where would you go in the old days? Well, there was a Solomon Brothers trading desk, right? So you have to go up to New York City and so forth. What about um, you know, venture capital that's typically uh, concentrated maybe in Silicon Valley and to an extent New York City and Boston? So you know, now that the internet connects the whole world, right? there's a potential to um, start a company, maybe even launch a bond and, you know, uh, source venture capital across the world or anywhere that's touching the internet. So this brings uh, to the sort of the next question here. 
you know, what do you think is hindering, um, you know, traditional and especially decentralized finance from realizing the full potential of the blockchain technology? Note that I think the internet has connected everyone in the world, so that infrastructure is there. Um, I think we do all possess the uh, technical, technical expertise to launch tokens, right? So is it sort of a tension between regulators trying to regulate their nation and their countries versus the internet that is sprawling across the whole world? So how are you going to sort of think about that? Is that one of the issues that possibly holding back the blockchain technology? I'll start on this side again. Um, well, I think... Um, we're at a, a, a very important juncture right now, especially in terms of cross-border securities and the ability to access new and interesting markets from an investor standpoint. The problem is that regulation right now is kind of stifling innovation and preventing new companies from kind of coming out um, and are weighing the alternatives of what the regulatory risk is of being able to take my product out here and sell something to a U.S. investor. Um, so I, I really believe that as uh, time progresses, we're going to see greater universal standards that are set in place that are not only adopted by the technology companies that are building the technologies themselves, but are embraced by the companies that are using these vehicles to be able to raise money, not only for their companies, but to be able to drive the ecosystems that the technology represents. Um, it's interesting you brought up uh, the e internet protocol because um, if you look at, um, it sort of points to the potential and opportunity as well as what's hindering, I think, traditional finance. Um, if you look at the pre-internet, we could have limited communication devices, phones, faxes, maybe a really clunky video conference call if you were lucky and get the connection to work. Um, and you were going through central exchanges that had to be connected to each other singly. So if you tried to explain to somebody, yeah, but you can call anyone you want, whenever you want, just by connecting to them through the internet because it's a network of networks, it was a communication protocol. So what it meant was is that your email that used to be proprietary in your company could now go anywhere in the world just by uh, simple, because everyone was using the sort of lingua franca of communication. The real potential of blockchain or distributed ledgers is to become the transaction protocol to the world. Because as I mentioned, every time you transact, you're going through a different infrastructure and really your financial services firms are, um, really acting as conduits to those multiple infrastructures and you pay for that privilege. Now, if you think about it, what happened in the, once the communication protocol, internet protocol came around? The communication companies became commoditized. So telephone companies suddenly, it wasn't about the connection, it was about the content. So all your communication companies have become streaming or content providers, not just connecting companies. Now think about it in terms of transactions. Once we make transactions commoditized because they're uniform, what do you need to do to become a transacting company? Well, you just need a banking license, and a brokerage license, a compliance officer, a risk officer, but you need a network of clients. So the Verizons of the world, the Walmarts of the world, the Googles, the Facebooks, they, have, they can take on this new technology with this pervasive transaction protocol and offer very new opportunities. And I think that's where the future is going to be. What's hindering, hindering the industry at the moment is, is getting to that, that transaction protocol as to be as efficient, as, as consistent as it needs to be. But there's a real potential future. And I've said to these other companies, the banks and brokers, you're safe for now because you're a legally required transaction hosting service. But your competitors are not going to be the other banks and brokers. They're going to be these other types of companies that buy banks and brokers. I think it's just evolving. Uh, if you, you know, we always see history always repeats. So if you guys remember like in 96, 95, 96, one of the Forbes magazine cover, there was a young kid trying to build an algorithm where the retailer investors can buy shares online. And suddenly all the brokers onto the floor suddenly scared saying, oh my God, there's a possibility of fraud and buying, inter buying stocks onto the internet may not, cannot be regulated. And eventually, 
when the regulators realize that, yes, this is a new technology, internet can make this market as a trillion dollar market if it is structured correctly. I think the same thing happening in the crypto space. Like, you know, it's brought enough attention and it's just a question of time that even including the regulators realize that if this is structured correctly, it can turn out to be another multi-trillion dollar market. We are just on the nearby the market. Absolutely. So now we're going to switch gears. Are there any uh, um, regulators in the crowd? Raise your hand. See, that's part of the problem. We need a, oh, there we go. There's one. All right. So now here's uh, a really interesting question, and we're shifting towards the regulations, because I think that's you know one of the themes that we're hearing here. Um, why is there a current push for regulations right now? You know, what are the right approaches? What are the best um, practices do you think that you know, we should be thinking about? Um, some people say that the SEC considers you know, all token securities. So what am I going to do if I want to try to raise capital and start a, a company and you know, live the American dream and start a business? Um, what are some of your thoughts in regards to best practices for um, regulators or for regulations? I think um, ACC look at from their official statement, like, you know, every token is a securities. Uh, so the first thing I think we need to understand the definition of securities. So any business when looking for a money, we typically get the money for three reasons. Either we sell something and in, ret in returns we get the money from the customer or else we borrow the money. That's called the securities. Or else we get the money to build a company. Now, if we use that money to build a company from a CC perspective or from financial perspective, it's a capital. And if, if the money being used as a capital, then it, those are what's called the securities. If a token company is issuing the tokens and bringing, getting the money in without providing the services right now, it definitely is called the securities. And I think every token issuer you know, should aware of that these kind of things. Like, you know, you look, take a look at the use case of a telegram. So telegram raised $1.7 billion and they offer say our services of the network will be available two years down the line. That means you raise the money as a capital, then you fall into the regulations. Now, are those regulations? There are so many exemptions and all the regulations are available, but if you guys want to add anything to this. Um, uh, um, my personal opinion um, is that um, you can have what are regulations of requirement in terms of you know banks or brokers needing to be re licensed or regulated because you do you do need some uh, form of uh, protection against um, you know potential scams and other things and this is where DeFi because it's mainly you know offshore and outside what we know as U.S. regulations has a bit of a, a free for all and, and and people have to protect themselves. Um, what I worry about is when there's an, an overzealous uh, nature for protection or reducing risk, and I call these regulations of aspiration, um, because they're trying to uh, create an outcome. And with the complex nonlinear world that we live in, it's very hard to really engineer outcomes. And I'll give you an example. You know, um, not so long ago, there was an advent of robo advisors, uh, which you could then sort of dial into and it showed you a risk thing and it automatically would, you know, fix your account, you know, based on your risk profile and make a selection of investments for you all through some robo program. Well, those didn't exist because someone thought this was good technology and it was a more efficient way to do it. It was the regulations were so complex that a registered investment advisor could not commercially advise you unless you had $500,000 or more in your account. Because the cost of compliance was so much that it would not be commercially viable. So if you want to talk about sort of, you know, you know, differentiating between you know, wealthy and not so wealthy, here you can only get advice if you've got a half a million dollars or more. Or now you're relying on robo-advisors. So again, this is where you know, consequences of actions can, can really have a a default, you know, a, a fault that nobody expects. Um, but what I, I do hope, what DeFi is showing us is there is innovative technology. And if we can do it within, uh, get the efficiencies and, you know, the innovation of DeFi combined with the scale and scope of traditional finance, then it begins to open up the world to much more cost of cost efficient transacting and simpler regulation and, and someone used the term rather than oversight insight you can actually track things and and think about it if you had real-time accounting data 
Bearings, full, you know, long-term capital management, Lehman Brothers, MF Global, FDX, with real-time accounting data would never have happened or they would have been seen to what they are almost immediately. And I'm not talking about having to disclose all your positions and things, just basic aggregate financial data. If you were required to, and I'm not saying publish it to the world, publish it to the regulator, publish it to the, your competitors, those, those events would never have been allowed to happen. And that's, that's what we've got the potential of, real-time insights. I think the perceived threat that central banks are under right now is overly exaggerated. And um, the markets themselves have not yet responded to definitive direction in terms of how the digital asset world should be treated. And I, I do agree that you know decentralization and certainly the adoption right now of DeFi protocols, as well as products that are built into a DeFi infrastructure, is opening up a kind of um, a new opportunity right now to uh, be able to set some regulatory initiatives in place that do not pose threats to A, the developers of those applications, so we want to not stifle innovation here, we want to kind of unlock it, and two, the United States is, um, has really been in a reactive position, especially from the SEC, to be able to react to uh, events that are going on across the capital markets that don't only affect us here in the U.S., but affect every other economy that's interfacing with the U.S. dollar and so forth. Um, there's a lot of countries out there that have made it a point now to be able to bring digital asset regulation into the forefront of not only their economies, but to kind of become a, a way of being able to attract business and attract companies to those marketplaces. I think due to the, the sheer number of regulators that are attached to the capital markets, there doesn't seem to be enough communication that's going on behind the scenes to be able to create coordination, legislation, and certainly direction for all of us that are in the industry right now that are trying to do the right thing in terms of being able to bring this technology forward. And I would say the capital markets forward at the same time. Uh, traditional investment banks right now are not what they were 10 years ago, certainly not what they were 25 years ago. And, you know, there's a new game in town. And, you know, we are kind of gatekeepers right now to make sure that this technology is not, doesn't cannibalize itself due to some bad actors that come in any, any capital market environment. Um, so I think that the U.S. needs to be able to create a policy that brings together all the regulators and kind of have like a, a digital asset czar right now, somebody to be a spokesman not only for the industry, because the technology is not going away, right? In fact, it's driving a lot of businesses that could be part of a, a future economic growth of this country into other marketplaces. And, um, you know, we, we have to lead by example. And the U.S. hasn't really taken on a, a leadership role in this space. Can I tell that? Because um, I think there was a comment earlier and a, um, about how when in the 90s there was a basic guidance, I think, came out of the White House on the Internet. And it really allowed the innovation of the internet to prosper. And, and therefore, uh, the US dominated in terms of uh, the internet-related technology. Um, so anything that's happening right now that's going to stifle this innovation, the good thing is, is that, unfortunately, if the US doesn't quite get it right, you know, we're talking to use cases in, you know, in India, in Asia, you know, in Latin America. So you're looking at jurisdictions, and I think to your point about joining the world, is this is being looked at globally from many jurisdictions' perspectives. So the opportunity for the innovation to show up um, is, is, uh, is, could arrive anywhere, and you know, we'll either be at the forefront or running alongside or catching up. <laughs> you know, so I think that's, um, and, and the other thing I'd just like to make uh, the comparison to with uh, blockchain or distributed ledger technology, in the same way emerging markets didn't need copper wire telephone infrastructure to put in mobile phones in place. You don't need legacy financial infrastructure 
to put in a decentralized or distributed ledger-based finance uh, industry. You could actually launch a working capital markets on a distributed ledger. And, and as long as you've got, you still need some sort of at least experienced institutions to help facilitate it. But what it means is you could land anywhere and set up a capital markets very, very quickly. And that's, that's, that's what I think you'll see. Uh, it'd be like mobile technology. Yeah, and on, the, on that ground, I think on a technical level, uh, the new protocols are coming up. For example, the, I would say the standards on the ERC, on Ethereum side, ERC 1400, is specially designed by the community for securities. So that actually shows that this market is evolving slowly. That way, tomorrow, if there is a securities exchange, uh, you know, if someone is launching a securities exchange, and if the token follows ERC 1400 law, you know, standards, it would be a very clear and transparent uh, KYC compliant transactions on the system. So, you know, one of the things that you guys said is, you know, don't stifle innovation. So as a professor, I get to inspire all these MBA students every year. And you kind of can see where they're headed. Um, when I first started teaching, you know, there's still some people wanting going to investment banks and consulting and so on. And you saw like sort of the pendulum swing. People wanted to go become tech entrepreneurs. And at one point, about 2017, there was a lot of excitement about ICOs and cryptos and blockchains. And there was a lot of hype. And we had the boom and the bust. And now, because of what's happening at the SEC and Gary Gensler, people, you know, it, I imagine the talent is about the same. They don't really, I say, what are you guys going to do when you graduate? And no one's really saying, I want to go to the crypto market anymore, right? So it's, it's actually very interesting, the tone effects, you know, not only the industries, but also the academic you know, circles and the students who are graduating, because nobody wants to go out there, get a job, and get thrown in jail or whatever it is. So it's actually very important that you know, we work with uh, people in the SEC and Treasury and the IRS and you know, CFTC because you're setting a tone that's going through even in the ivory tower, which I think is fascinating. But since this is a forward-looking sort of capital markets panel discussion, um, what are some of the opportunities that you guys are seeing? Suppose that you had to start your own startup business. Where would you sort of position your business or the opportunities looking forward in this current environment you know, as of now? Well, I, you know, I think um, on the investment banking side, um, distributed ledger kind of produces a, a completely new opportunity to be able to issue and create new security classes, especially at the critical early stage uh, days of a company that is trying to launch itself. It's not necessarily the ICO. It could be something else. And investment banks are still playing a very, very traditional game of, um, you know, long, you know, frustrating processes, especially for companies that are looking to raise money, because raising money is not, you know, an I my idea of a good time. It's bringing <laughs> innovation to marketplace is really, it's very, very compelling to me. And as you have this, uh, I would say, this pool of innovation that is coming from every corner of the globe, we shouldn't be limited to jurisdictional distribution of those opportunities. Uh, we should try to unify that in a way to be able to accelerate the, the capital injection into these companies and to launch the you know, next generation of unicorns. Um, well, I'd, I'd like to say that we, we represent uh, Layer 1 Protocol Tapestry X. So we've solved the problem for the capital markets. So I wouldn't encourage your students to go there. <laughs> no. <laughs> but, um, but if I was looking at what's out there in the industry, um, and as I said, these Layer 1 protocols are going to be like TCPIP. So it'll be in the background. It'll be, f no, no, you know, when we had this comment earlier in the conference, you don't know how in the internet works, but you just push a button and you get an Uber driver come up to you, you know? So what's going to happen with transactions? And you're asking me or us to imagine, like, at the beginning of the internet, it was like, oh, it's web pages. Oh, it's something. Oh, you can buy a book online. But social media? You know, and, and Google and, and all the other, uh, Uber, Airbnb, all these businesses, all these new opportunities that came out of this technology. So start to think about if you've got, 
you, is, as much as you sort of say push the button now, whenever you transact on your phone, how many different apps do you have on your phone to transact with, depending on which transaction you're actually doing? Imagine now it's just transacting as easy as connecting. You're not actually transacting. You're saying, I want to go do something. It just happens to involve transactions. I think, although the metaverse has had its sort of hiccups uh, and full starts, and I've, I'm trying to talk to my, um, believe me, my kids laugh at me. If you're designing the future, how come you have no apps on your phone? You know, <laughs> but um, and, you know, so I'm a bit of a luddite when it comes to that sort of thing. But the metaverse is a digital working economy, and from my, what I understand from my oldest son is that the gaming companies are working on, the problem is, is one game can't talk to another. So can the avatars go between games? So if they start to solve those problems, you're going into a working digital economy where you don't want to think about how much, what do I put, what credit card do I pull out, what, what payment app do I use? You just want to be in there and be able to transact. So, but you're really, the transaction is just, you know, just facilitating whatever you're enjoying or participating in. And I think, that's where it's going to get really, really interesting because we just make transaction commoditized and, uh, and then you're, you're enjoying a sort of digital world you know, with, with things that we can't imagine right now because we couldn't imagine Google and Airbnb and uh, you know, uh, you know, all these other services. And so I think it's going to be, that's where I'd encourage them to think about you know, if you're in that transacting universe and it's commoditized, what are the possible business opportunities that you can find in those? I think the, the kids coming out of the school compared to 2017, as you said, like in ICOs, uh, and now it's a little bit scared about, do I jump into the gel? Uh, so the most important thing, I think, the industry, or uh, the kids, or even the, including the industry, need to understand the definition of crypto. Uh, from my perspective, the cryptocurrency itself is the wrong word, because there is no such kind of a, you know, instrument called as a cryptocurrency. Crypto should fall into one of the four categories. When you call crypto, it should be either securities, it can be a commodity, it can be a stable coin or CBDC, or it can be a utility token. There is no cryptocurrency because what, do you, what does the cryptocurrency technically means is there's nothing. It, it has to be either securities, commodity, or stable coin versus CBDC or the utility, and you know, something you are using the services against it. So I think the if if the if the kids understand that where do they want to jump into it, they can find innovative ideas to solve their current life problems. Um, so, the, you know, as an academic, one of the questions that I always have is, um, are we doing a good job educating the regulators, the legislators, are we, uh, um, or are we just sitting by ourselves and just sort of <laughs> saying, you know, don't kill the um, innovation? Um, so what are your thoughts with regards to the education? Do you think we're doing a pretty good job? I know GBA is actively trying to educate more and more people about blockchain technology and, you know, uh, tokens and digital assets. You know, where, where are we standing? Is the ivory tower doing a good job? Are we doing a good job? What do you, you know, where are your thoughts there? Because I, that comes up over and over, um, kind of year after year, I think, you know, the, the, the need for the education or the, the desire for people to learn a little bit more about um, some of these um, topics. And, you know, I teach the cryptos in blockchains class, and um, I've noticed that um, while most, I mean, I've never seen a student not understand all the technical details, but you have to spend some time and go through sort of, you know, examples. And, you know, we give them a wallet and we show them, you know, one of the assignments is hack Professor Liu's wallet, <laughs> right? So they can know how to protect themselves. And, of course, we do everything on the test net so nobody loses any money. But uh, what happens is they can go into the, the, the blockchain and actually find their transactions. And they can see their wallets and all this other stuff. And then a lot of light bulbs go off. So I think, you know, getting there and actually, you know, working on some of this stuff and actually seeing the technical stuff is important because then you get a much better understanding of what's going on. But, you know, what are your guys' thoughts on, you know, is the Ivory Tower doing a good job? Are we doing a good job as G GBA sort of members? Well, I think GBA is certainly doing not a good job but a great job at bringing events like this together that we can openly talk and not only share our opinions, but hopefully inspire some sort of change from these uh, uh, meetings like this. Um, you know, I think um, the, the concept of creating that killer app that a billion people can use is on our horizon. We just haven't seen it yet. 
And I think this is part of the intimidation factor of new people that kind of come into the industry or are trying to interface with kind of crypto. Things have a tendency to get complicated very, very quick if you let it uh, be complicated. And, you know, we're seeing some very interesting com companies coming out right now that are trying to define that. Of course, this is centered around investing, uh, but there's all gamification attached to it right now. So if we're dealing with the, you know, let's say the future generation that is growing up in a gamified world, that simplification, that interface to be able to engage with uh, cryptocurrency and kind of, frankly, other technologies that are not necessarily there about just making money or investing in something. They're actually serving some sort of purpose, especially in terms of allowing my vote to be heard across some sort of ledger. I now have the opportunity to be able to effectuate change on my own level. And I think this is what the regulators don't get. They're still, you know, going through, um, you know, current, you know, regulatory documents that, you know, frankly, to tell you the truth, you know, are very, very complex uh, for us to understand from the outside in. But there has to be a definitive uh, statement that is made in terms of, okay, this technology is here. We're, 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 we understand that. We're not here to stifle it. We're here to kind of unlock it and bring it across so that the efficiencies and the economies of scale can be deployed so that these new economies that we're all part of uh, can, you know, live and be, become sustainable. No, I agree, uh, um, the Brian saying, the GBA, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, allows free membership for government employees. I've personally met, um, you know, different members of the government here, the regulators. Um, as, as a protocol, we actually, uh, and I'd encourage anybody who's doing this, we, you can present to the SEC's FinTech Hub so they want to see new technology before it gets launched, and even FINRA, FINRA have a technology group we presented to. Um, I think the other thing, we, I mean, I saw an interesting article, and I wish I could remember which one it was in, but it actually compared the current crypto DeFi world to the financial services at the turn of the last century, sort of pre-stock market crash and pre-33, 34 act, and it was a bit of a wild west, and so people are still trying to find it. But I also, you know, we're, um, and I said this um, earlier, if you think about it, tokenization kind of exists with ADRs and EDFs. They're slow motion versions. Um, you know, digiti um, digitization is book entry accounting. Decentralization is an over-the-counter market. And even stable coins, you know, what is a traveler's check? What is a, you know, prepaid um, gift card? It's a, you know, it's a form of a dollar-backed uh, transactions. It's just that they work very slow and they're very clunky. So what we're trying to say with that, you know, when we've gone to these regulators is to say, we're actually operating within the same regulations. We're just doing it slightly different. The only thing you have to be concerned about is that there's this distributed ledger that operates in real time. But the point I come back to, and what I said at the first, is what would real time accounting have done for you is with respect to risk or exposure, you know, or understanding. And, and when you start transacting in real time, um, you're, you're creating better price transparency, better liquidity. And that's, that's where if the markets can get there, um, it's actually going to be ultimately better and simpler to, to uh, operate and regulate. So we're trying sort of multiple fronts with that. Um, but it does, it, it, it does, what I think I, I, when I sometimes hear the hearings, they're hearing the latest from sort of biased people <laughs> and then trying to react to what needs to be done based on that stage of the invest, you know, where the, the uh, product development is. They really need to sort of try and back off and, and wait until, you know, you, I don't want to necessarily react too late, but I think sometimes the proactive regulation can kill the innovation. Um, my experience is I tried uh, presenting it to the regulators, top executives, and been directed to FinTech Hub and ACC. And we presented and they ready to listen it. So that shows that uh, they are interested in knowing the things. But on another note, I would say, uh, if you look at our Congress, how many are the lawyers and how many are the PhDs sitting there? So unless, unless we move on to technological side into leadership, I think 
that's a bigger challenge that is required on our on our leadership side. Yeah, Not yeah, only the lawyers. Sorry, just to add something. Um, we need an on-ramp right now to be able to kind of bring more people, not only into the, the, on an industry level, but on the consumer side of things. And um, the one thing I think this industry is missing is kind of the concept of an SRO that we subscribe to at the end of the day and participate in to be able to try to create a deeper level of self-regulation in this industry. We have responsibilities, not only to our own products and building sustainability, but it's really the communities that are on the other side that are buying into kind of what we're doing. And it's not just having a small cap table of you know 10 or 15 investors. It could be a cap table of 50,000 participants that, you know again, deploying DAO-like functionality towards having a vote will hopefully someday enable tokenized environments and tokenized companies to be able to deliver SEC quality financial reporting to the activities underneath there because it's not just about network transactions. And thinking a, a little bit forward here, I think the valuation metrics that companies are applied against right now in the future are not going to be traditional PE values, but it really has to do with social impact and the ability for us to you know, how much uh, of effect do, do our companies have on stuff like the environment? And, you know, I think those are the companies that are going to really win at the end of the day that are looking at sustainability as a, a strategy. So, um, you know, I'm watching, uh, obviously, chat GPT uh, users go from millions to hundreds of millions. And then, you know, the regulators just going to have to sort of deal with the hallucination on all the issues. But you know what I've noticed is that, it's, especially in the Ivy Tower, it brings a lot of value to the users in order to for them to you know whatever it may be, write their papers. You know we try to catch that, <laughs> um, you know create uh, advertising campaigns and so forth. Now, so one of the questions I'm always asking myself is, you know, suppose uh, Gary Gensler, if he if he just stood down and the SEC said, yeah, go ahead, do what you want to do in blockchain land, and we encourage innovation in America. You know, have we just not come up with the right sort of project that unleashes that much value like ChatGPT? And so, you know, is that one of the things that, because a lot of people say, oh, you know, the regulatory environment is very uncertain, right? But suppose it was a, a completely certain. They said, you can do whatever you want, kind of like the internet, trying to get usage up in the internet. Do we, you know, where, where are the projects that are exploding and then you can actually point to and say, oh, because of the regulatory environment, it's hindering the growth of this particular project. You know, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> I mean, the, 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 name a project, right, that you can identify that is because of the, what's happening in the U.S., it's holding that potential back. And you think if the SEC was, you know, much more open about letting people sort of go out there and do things in crypto, whether it's a security or not a security, or if there was a very, very clear sandbox, they said, okay, in this area, <laughs> as long as you show us your wallet and this is you, you can do what you want and develop. And we're, we're going to leave you alone for three years. Well, I think right? ChatGPT is a great example. Um, there is a tokenized environment underneath it all. And, you know, as an enterprise user on the API for some time, um, you know, this could easily be a cryptocurrency at the end of the day because of the value that it's kind of creating um, along those lines. I think that the, uh, the U.S. specifically, to get more involved, they should just come out with their own digital dollar and use that as a stable coin at the end of the day to be able to kind of underpin any of these other currencies and actually participate on a, on a token level with us. Okay, uh, we have a question. Yes, I'm, I'm good. I can speak up. I can speak up. So, okay, great. So I want to tie with the, the last panel, the, the last panel with your panel, sort of kind of in a weird way. And you ask about a killer app. I'm just going to pretend that I'm the average guy who hadn't been in crypto for 10 or 11 years. Two years ago, the average bank in the United States paid 0.012% on a savings account. That means I get 120 bucks for every $100,000 I have in the bank. USDC Circle, if I was staking, right, or if I was yield farming somewhere else, might have paid me five, six, seven percent, correct? Now, if you have 300 million people that figure out that if I'm staking or yield farming, I'm going to get paid 100 times more than what the bank is paying me, that's a killer app. 
if you let it live. But if I regulate it out of existence, if I called it, you know, what, a security instead of a commodity, then I'm killing that off before it can evolve and become what it's supposed to be. Do you understand what I'm saying? By the way, props to USDC. You guys tried to build on Bitcoin, but couldn't, and it became an ERC-20 token. I'm, I'm not an so expert. Then, here's my question to you. Here's my question. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Here's my question. For the panel, do you believe that sometimes these regulations are put into place before you can see it all play out? Because one or two knuckleheads, and I think you said it, and another guy said it, doesn't make it bad for the whole badge. That's all I'm saying. I'll well, rest my mic. I was going to say, if you, if you wanted the three years of let's go for it, then, uh, you know, caveat emptor, buyer beware. So the, the problem I have with what you call staking, and I'm, you know, I come from an you know, experience of margin finance, lending to hedge funds. So, you know, as much as you say buy low, sell high, you know, banks and financing, borrow low and lend high, yeah? Even Jimmy Stewart did it at three and six, remember, in The Wonderful Life, <laughs> all right? Staking is not spread-based financing. Staking is an unhedged delta one swap, right? If they tell you it's an unhedged delta one swap and we're gonna pay you 6% until we lose it all, then I'm happy for you to have it. What they don't do is they say it's 6% and we've got all these smart contracts that will sort it out and protect you. And they weren't able to. So it's a matter of where's the full disclosure. And I think to the point about self-regulation, if you can disclose the truth behind these instruments, then everybody knows what they're buying. And if you don't know what a, a Dota return swap de without its Dota one hedge, you look it up. You've got to, that's what you've got to, you've got to educate yourself. Great. This is the complexity oh, with the uh, synthetics also. We're dealing with very, very complex financial instruments right here that we don't understand. We just see a, you know, a yield and we think, hey, that's great. But the risk is not calculated in there. And, you know, due to the events over the course of the last two years with, uh, you know, Celsius and some of the other larger failures that went in place, um, you know, it's clearly evident that the consumer wasn't protected there. Absolutely. Well, hang on a second. Guys, we got to cut this panel discussion. Great question. You guys follow up afterwards. Brian, Paul, Pramod, thank you so much. Great job. Thank you. Thank you.